Catacombs of Crime Goes Beyond Unsolved Mysteries In this video we go beyond unsolved mysteries to examine the evidence and discuss the theories behind the mysterious death of former White House aide Jack Wheeler. The Washington Insider Murder What Happened to John Jack Wheeler? The theories examined. On the 31st of December 2010 a body was discovered at the Cherry Island landfill. The body is quickly identified as that of John Jack Wheeler III, a West Point graduate and former White House aide. The death is ruled a homicide and a vigorous investigation follows but produces few leads and no answers. The case becomes complicated when a neighbour reports a burglary at Jack's home and an investigation into an arson attack across the street leads back to Jack. The case takes a bizarre turn when police examine CCTV footage of Jack in the days preceding his death. What happened to Jack Wheeler? One of the most important things to understand about this case is that Jack Wheeler was not your average man. A West Point graduate and Vietnam veteran, Jack went on to graduate from both Harvard and Yale. He worked for several different presidential administrations and was a White House aide during the Bush administration. He had extensive contacts in the government and was currently working in defence security as a contractor for the MITRE Corporation, working in the area of cyber security. Given his illustrious career, there has been some speculation that his death was a contract killing, a targeted hit. Indeed, this is what his family believe happened. However, there has been no indication or evidence that his previous or current occupation was connected to his death. Another important factor in this case is that Jack had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. His wife reported that he was disciplined with taking his medication, but stated that he could get a little manic, but usually was just normal old Jack. So the first twist in this case comes when police at the landfill contact Jack's local police force, the Newcastle Police Department, to inform them of the discovery of the body. At that time, the Newcastle City Police were currently en route to Jack's house to respond to reports of a burglary after a neighbour raised the alarm. The report of a burglary at Jack's home casts a dark shadow over the discovery of the body and police immediately suspect foul play. And this will become an important factor later on in the case. The second important twist in the case comes from the fact that while all this is going on, a third investigation is underway at the house across the street from Jack's home. The house, which is currently under construction, has been subject to an arson attack, with somebody letting off smoke bombs. There was little damage caused, but when investigators comb the scene, they discover a mobile phone, which turns out to belong to Jack Wheeler. So, there are three investigations occurring at the same time. The discovery of Jack's body at the landfill, the reported burglary at his Newcastle home, and the arson investigation underway at the house across the street. When Jack's phone is lost at the house under construction, investigators are unable to rely on it to help build a timeline of what Jack did in the days and hours before his death. In the absence of the phone data, Detectives were forced to rely on CCTV footage and a number of witness sightings. The sparse bits of CCTV footage available of Jack are haunting and mysterious, and they form an important part of this bizarre case. The account of what happened leading up to, Jack, leading up to Jack's death can get a little complicated, and the best way to communicate the information is to draw a timeline of events. So the significant time period in this case is the last week of December 2010. Jack's body was found on New Year's Eve, Friday the 31st, and the timeline begins exactly one week earlier on Christmas Eve, which was Friday the 24th. On Christmas Eve, Jack arrived in New York by train to spend Christmas with his family. His wife and stepdaughter remember him to have been in good spirits. On Tuesday the 28th of December, Jack leaves New York and travels to Washington DC by train for work. 
This is much to his wife's annoyance, as she hadn't expected him to return to work so soon after Christmas. She thought that they had plans to go to the cinema together and see a movie, and was quite annoyed that Jack wanted to return to work. So Jack returns to Washington DC and works for around half a day. Then at 5.30 he catches a train to Newcastle, Delaware, where Jack has a second home. So Jack's returned to his second home in Newcastle, Delaware. At 11pm that evening, the arson incident at the house across the street from Jack occurs, and Jack's phone is later found in the garden. The next day is Wednesday the 29th, and at 9.31am, Jack sends an email to his workplace, stating that his wallet, phone and works ID badge have been stolen. But he does not report this theft to the police or to his wife. So Jack's now without a phone, and investigators are relying solely on CCTV footage and witness sightings from here on out. At 6.42pm, Jack is spotted entering his local pharmacy. According to the pharmacist, he was asking for a ride to Wilmington, and this is where he had parked his car before travelling by train to New York for Christmas. A couple of patrons in the store at the time offered to give him a lift to Wilmington. The next time we see Jack is on CCTV inside a parking garage in Wilmington, and his condition has deteriorated significantly. He appears distressed, confused, angry, He's only wearing one shoe and holding the other in his hand. He doesn't realise it, but Jack is in the wrong garage. His car is actually parked in a parking lot a few blocks away. But before we move on, let's take a look at that footage. So if you can see, he's actually holding his shoe in his left hand. And he seems quite angry and he doesn't look in a good way. He's obviously limping. He's like gesticulating and seems quite distressed. Okay, so move them back to the timeline. The next time we see Jack, it's the following day, Thursday the 30th of December. Approximately 21 hours have passed since we saw Jack in the parking garage. He is recorded at 3.36pm on CCTV in the Nemours building, which is in downtown Wilmington. It is believed that Jack spent the night and part of the day in the basement of this large building. It is not known why he was there or whether he had any connection to the building. He is captured on CCTV at various points between 3.36 and 8.39pm, walking through the corridors. At some point he acquires a black hooded sweatshirt and can be seen wearing it. At 8.39pm he exits the building, and at 8.41pm the last confirmed sighting of Jack is captured on the CCTV of a nearby hotel as he walks by into the cold December night with his hood pulled up. There is an unconfirmed witness sighting of Jack at 11pm that night. Someone tried a taxi with a man to Newark and they believe that that man was Jack. At 9.56am the following morning, Jack's body is found at the landfill in Newark.
14 miles from Wilmington, the last place Jack was seen alive, which adds credence to the witness report about him sharing a taxi down to Newark. Through diligent investigative work and DNA sampling, the trash surrounding Jack's body is traced back to the city of Newark, and a particular trash dumpster is identified as the one which contained Jack's body, which was emptied with the trash and carried to the landfill. According to the attendant at the parking garage, Jack told her that his briefcase had been stolen. She asked him where the ticket was for his car and he said that the ticket was in the briefcase and just kept repeating, my briefcase has been stolen, it's been stolen. In the CCTV footage, Jack does seem agitated and distressed and very vulnerable. Interestingly, he does not ask the attendant to contact the police or give any further details of the theft. He does not report that he is unable to locate his car and I think it's interesting and significant that he does not ask for further assistance or help. I also believe that if the parking attendant had contacted the police and kept Jack in her office until they arrived, he probably wouldn't have died. So what happened to Jack Wheeler? Broadly speaking, there are three main theories which attempt to account for what happened. And these are a murder for hire or contract type killing, a random mugging or assault which escalated to a murder, or an accidental death, sometimes known as a death by misadventure. On consideration of the available evidence, it's my belief that Jack unfortunately passed away due to accidental death or death by misadventure, and that there was nobody else involved in his death. So let's explore the evidence for and against each theory. So first of all, let's consider the murder for hire contract killing. There are a couple of paths you can go down with this angle. Um, the first and perhaps most obvious is related to Jack's occupation, his past employment and his government connections. As we've already discussed, Jack was an extraordinary man with an illustrious career working for a number of presidential administrations. He was a White House aide during the Bush administration and at the time of his death he was employed as a contractor working in the area of cybersecurity. Is it possible that Jack had made powerful enemies during his political career? Or perhaps he was targeted due to his current occupation? The Unsolved Mysteries episode on Netflix about Jack's death is called The Washington Insider Murder, which gives the impression that Jack's death was connected to his career in Washington or his status as a government insider. In this episode, his family intimate that they believe Jack was the victim of a murder for hire and have stated that no one ever came forward with information despite the large reward available and that this may be because they had already been paid. So there is the government security angle. And secondly, there is the dispute that Jack was involved in with his neighbor over the building of a house in historic Battery Park. Jack was reportedly very fired up about this. Um, we can assume with some degree of certainty that Jack was responsible for the arson attack at this house on the 28th of December. Is it possible that this dispute had escalated to the point where somebody ordered Jack's murder, perhaps in retribution for the arson attack? I think it's unlikely that someone was hired to murder Jack because of his career or the housing dispute for the following reasons. If Jack was the victim of a murder for hire, I would expect his manner of death to involve a gunshot, poison or possibly a knife, depending on the type of hit ordered. The autopsy showed that Jack's injuries were reportedly consistent with the beating though I will dispute this conclusion shortly. Jack, however, was not shot or stabbed or poisoned, which makes me think it was not a professional hit. If we look at Jack's demeanor and behavior in the days preceding his death, he is demonstrating distress, confusion, and erratic, nonsensical behavior. This, along with the knowledge that he had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, a severe mental illness indicates to me that he was possibly in a mental health crisis. There is a lot of inconsistent evidence which just does not fit in with him being the victim of a targeted attack. In addition to this, in the days leading up to Jack's death, he travelled extensively. An assassin would need to know where to find their victim, and if Jack was a target, it would have been easy to find out where he was spending Christmas 
and the hit could have been carried out there. Once Jack leaves the family home, he travels a lot and his spatial behaviour is inconsistent, making it difficult for someone to track him down. For these reasons, I don't think that Jack was the victim of a murder for hire or a contract killing. The second theory is that Jack was the victim of a random mugging or assault, which turned deadly. I have a few problems with this theory too, but let's look at the evidence which supports it. The autopsy claimed that Jack's injuries were consistent with a beating. Jack claimed to have been the victim of a robbery himself on two separate occasions. First, when he emailed work on December the 29th to say that his wallet, ID badge and phone were stolen. And secondly, later that day when he told the parking garage attendant that his briefcase had been stolen. Additionally, on December the 29th, when he went into his local pharmacy, he requested and accepted a ride to Wilmington with two unknown persons. When we see Jack again on CCTV in the wrong parking garage, he is distressed and holding one of his shoes. Is it possible that he was assaulted by the unknown persons who gave him a lift? Did they steal his briefcase? If that is the case, was Jack unfortunate enough to be the victim of two separate attacks, one of which he walked away from and one in which he was killed. I think, however, it has been confirmed that the police were able to track down the unknown persons who gave Jack a ride, and we can assume that they were ruled out of the investigation early on. The major piece of evidence which contradicts the theory of a mugging gone wrong is that Jack was found with many valuables. One of the biggest issues with the mugging gone wrong theory is that Jack was found with many of his valuables still about his person. He was still wearing an expensive Rolex watch, he was wearing his West Point ring and he still had cash on him. It is unlikely a mugger would miss such valuables. It would also be unusual for a mugger to dispose of the body in this way. Typically, when a mugging goes wrong and the victim ends up dying, the assailant will leave the body where it falls. Disposing of a body was not part of their plan. If Jack was not targeted by a hired killer, or he was not the victim of a robbery, then what happened to him? The final theory, and the one which I believe to have the most merit, is that Jack died an accidental death. He was not murdered. So why do I think this? We've already discussed Jack's bizarre behaviour in the days preceding his death. Is it possible that Jack was experiencing a mental health crisis? We know that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Is it possible that Jack stopped taking his medication over Christmas? We know Jack had memory issues and was very forgetful. Is it possible that he simply forgot to take his medication? With pharmacies and doctor's surgeries being closed for Christmas, is it possible Jack ran out of medication? Perhaps he forgot to collect his prescription in time. Perhaps he deliberately chose to refrain from taking his medication over Christmas so he could partake in a few Christmas drinks. Psychiatric medication can interact with alcohol and it's not unprecedented for people to stop taking their medication to allow themselves to drink alcohol. I also think it's possible that Jack lost his medication when he lost his briefcase. The briefcase is an interesting factor in this case, and it's worth considering its path for a couple of minutes. The briefcase itself has never been located. On the 29th of December, Jack told the parking garage attendant that his briefcase had been stolen, but in CCTV footage of him earlier that day as he entered the pharmacy, Jack did not have his briefcase with him then either. We can assume he had the briefcase with him when he left his family home after Christmas and went to work in DC for the day. I can only assume that he had the briefcase with him while he was at work, as he probably couldn't work without it. He then left DC for Delaware, travelling by train, and I think it's possible he left the briefcase on the train or at the station. If his medication was inside, then Jack is now without any pills.
The final theory, and the one which I believe to have the most merit, is that Jack died an accidental death. He was not murdered. So why do I think this? We've already discussed Jack's bizarre behaviour in the days preceding his death. Is it possible that Jack was experiencing a mental health crisis? We know that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Is it possible that Jack stopped taking his medication over Christmas? We know Jack had memory issues and was very forgetful. Is it possible that he simply forgot to take his medication? With pharmacies and doctors' surgeries being closed for Christmas, is it possible Jack ran out of medication? Perhaps he forgot to collect his prescription in time. Perhaps he deliberately chose to refrain from taking his medication over Christmas so he could partake in a few Christmas drinks. Psychiatric medication can interact with alcohol and it's not unprecedented for people to stop taking their medication to allow themselves to drink alcohol. I also think it's possible that Jack lost his medication when he lost his briefcase. The briefcase is an interesting factor in this case, and it's worth considering its path for a couple of minutes. The briefcase itself has never been located. On the 29th of December, Jack told the parking garage attendant that his briefcase had been stolen, but in CCTV footage of him earlier that day as he entered the pharmacy, Jack did not have his briefcase with him then either. We can assume he had the briefcase with him when he left his family home after Christmas and went to work in DC for the day. I can only assume that he had the briefcase with him while he was at work, as he probably couldn't work without it. He then left DC for Delaware, travelling by train, and I think it's possible he left the briefcase on the train or at the station. If his medication was inside, then Jack is now without any pills. On the 29th of December, Jack told the parking garage attendant that his briefcase had been stolen. But in CCTV footage of him earlier that day as he entered the pharmacy, the night the arson incident occurs at Jack's neighbor's house, I believe we can safely assume that Jack was responsible for this. This arson incident is another sign that Jack's mental health might be unraveling. He accidentally loses his phone at the scene, and I think Jack realised this mistake as soon as he got home. In a fit of rage and frustration, he throws around some things in the kitchen, upending a pot plant and knocking stuff off the kitchen counter onto the floor. It's this disturbance to the scene which his neighbour later discovers and believes to be evidence of a break-in. If you remember, the day Jack's body was found, the local police were already en route to his house, responding to a potential break-in, reported by his neighbour who had a key to the house. The report of this break-in at Jack's home increased suspicions about the nature of Jack's death, and I believe that this led the police and medical examiner to conclude that, that the death was suspicious before an adequate investigation had been completed. It's interesting that when Jack realises he has left his phone at the scene of the arson incident, he emails his work the following day to say that his phone has been stolen. He later tells the garage attendant his briefcase has been stolen. Perhaps he's beginning to get confused between what he has lost or misplaced and thinks that it has been taken. Jack does not report any of these apparent thefts to the police, nor does he inform his wife. And I think it's interesting that Jack consistently fails to ask for help. I think this is another sign of his deteriorating mental state. He is no longer able to think rationally and logically about his situation. Jack reportedly had a very bad memory. It was not unusual for him to forget where he had parked his car. His wife and daughter jokingly report that Jack would sometimes return home in a taxi because he couldn't find his car. And on the night of the 29th of December, Jack turns up in the wrong parking garage looking for his car. He's also lost his briefcase and left his phone in his neighbor's yard. 
I think there's a strong possibility that Jack had the beginnings of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. I think the early warning signs had, such as the forgetfulness, had been missed by Jack's family. He had been a very intelligent and successful man, and it would not be easy to acknowledge that Jack was possibly deteriorating. On the day before Jack's death, he is spotted once again on CCTV footage in the Nemours building. He apparently spends the majority of the day and possibly a night in this labyrinthine basement of this building which appears to have a huge network of underground tunnels. In the Unsolved Mysteries episode about the case, it states that Jack had no connection with this building, but I have since learnt from an article published in Delaware Today that it housed his solicitor's offices, and Jack had attended and asked to speak to his lawyer, but then left after waiting only a short time. During this time, Jack does not ask anyone else for help, he does not try to find a phone or take any action to extricate himself from the situation. And I think this is a huge warning sign that Jack is no longer thinking or behaving rationally, and his mental capacity is seriously questionable. On the 30th of December at 8.39, Jack exits the Nemours building wearing a black hoodie which he has acquired from somewhere. He is spotted at 8.41 by a hotel camera as he walks away into the cold, dark night. What Jack did and where he went from here is unknown. What we do know is that he was present in a garbage dumpster on the morning of December 31st when it was emptied by a commercial trash truck driver Mike Grabowski and transported to the Cherry Island landfill. Tragically, it's not unusual for people to voluntarily climb into dumpsters for warmth and a sheltered place to sleep for the night. In fact, it's become such an issue that waste management companies have worked with homeless shelters to educate about the dangers of sleeping in a dumpster. Too many people are crushed to death or seriously maimed by doing this every year. The truck driver who emptied the dumpster stated that it was not unusual, unusual for someone to, and this is a quote, pop up at the top or climb out of the side door. He also stated, and this is another quote, we call them howlers because that's what they do. They jump up, whoa, whoa, and sometimes you hear them, and sometimes you can't. I think this is a very sad but telling statement. The average temperature in Delaware in December is minus 0.9 degrees C, or 30.4 degrees F, which is pretty cold. I think Jack probably voluntarily climbed into the dumpster to escape the cold and find some shelter. It's also not unusual for persons with Alzheimer's disease to hide themselves upon getting lost. Research into missing persons has noted that individuals with diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's disease may deliberately conceal themselves and through confusion or fear, fail to ask for help or respond to the voices of people calling their names during searches, even if they can hear them. As has been clearly stated online by waste management companies, if a person is inside a dumpster when it is emptied into a trash truck, there is a significant risk of injury or death. And if we look at the type of injury sustained by Jack, the autopsy report mentions fractured ribs and punctured lungs. The cause of death is listed as blunt force trauma. These injuries are consistent with being crushed by a trash truck. The medical examiner listed Jack's manner of death as a homicide. I believe this is incorrect, and I think the error was likely made because the autopsy was unusually performed the day that Jack's body was found. The police were under the impression that the death was suspicious, especially given the report of the break-in at Jack's house, and they conveyed this impression to the medical examiner, 
who investigated Jack's injuries in light of this suspicion. I think it would have been beneficial for a second autopsy to have been performed by an impartial examiner to see what they would find. Whatever happened to Jack on that cold December night, it was a tragedy and a desperately sad end for such a fascinating, successful man. The case of Jack Wheeler has echoes of the disappearance of a British young man called Corrie McKeague, who disappeared aged 23 and was believed to have been possibly crushed to death by a bin lorry. His remains are believed to be in the Barton Mills landfill, but searchers have failed to uncover his body. There are also some similarities to the bizarre death of Canadian student Elisa Lam, who was found deceased in the water tank atop the Cecil Hotel in downtown LA. Elisa, like Jack, had bipolar disorder and was also captured behaving bizarrely on CCTV in the hours before her death. Officially, the case into Jack Wheeler's death is still open. Delaware Crime Stoppers is offering a cash reward for information leading to the arrest of subjects responsible for the death of John Jack Wheeler III. If you have any information about the death of John Jack Wheeler III, please contact Delaware Crime Stoppers on 1-800-TIP-3333. 3333 or go to DelawareCrimestoppers.com or Unsolved.com.